Thank you, Alana, for that wonderful introduction. Um, thank you, Dean Rutherford, uh, Daryl Coker, for making it possible to come here. Thank you for your t all of you taking your lunch hour to come out and hear this somewhat weary speaker. I uh, got in at about 3 in the morning after witnessing a, a, a beautiful lightning show at the Denver airport. <laughs> So I, I've had uh, six cups of coffee and a Diet Coke, so I may either fall over backwards or break out in song. Uh, I wanted to give you advance warning. I'm also at the uh, 11th stop of a 12-stop book tour that began inauspiciously in New York at the beginning of April at a large chain bookstore um, in a cavernous room with eight people out there. <laughs> three of whom were colleagues at Civic Ventures. <laughs> Two thought it was the night David Sedaris was reading. They did not find my jokes or timing to be particularly uh, keen. Uh, the other two, though, were rapt attention. One man was apparently reading the book as I was speaking, um, and uh, his wife, seated next to him, was taking careful notes. I rushed up to them at the end of the talk to discover the guy had been reading a Mediterranean cookbook, which he didn't want to shell out the 25 bucks for, and his wife was just completing the Sudoku puzzle, which she thought was probably better for brain development than anything I had to say. So um, it's great to be in a room of people who care about public service um, and uh, that the door is barred as well. I. Um, I uh, often start out these talks by invoking Joseph Campbell, the great scholar of myths, who said that midlife is when you get to the top of the ladder and discover it's leaning against the wrong wall. And I uh, hit midlife, and, and I actually, I was, wasn't at the top of the ladder, I actually was comfortable with the wall, but I was thinking of another quote by Margaret Mead's daughter, Mary Catherine Bateson, who wrote in Harvard Business Review a few years ago that we'd stretch midlife so long it'd become like a run-on sentence in desperate need of punctuation. <laughs> and I was in desperate need of punctuation. I'd hit, hit 50, uh, had a one-year-old and a three-year-old. I'd been working long hours and saving all of my vacation time, and I decided I was going to take a break. And when we had at Civic Ventures read the Mary Catherine Bateson quote about the need for punctuation. I, uh, we, we started a branding campaign. We we're trying to find out, well, is it a period? No, that's too finite, final. Is it, a, is it a comma? No, that's not really a sufficient pause. We ended up with the semicolon. Um, then semicolon now, not really thinking that a branding campaign built around a partial colon wasn't necessarily a... <laughs> Uh, a breakthrough idea for a 50-plus audience, but uh, anyway, I took my semicolon and I started planning this grand trip. I had three months of vacation time. I was going to go to Australia, and I started buying guidebooks. Um, piles started growing higher, and um, and as the weeks between the departure date started growing shorter, I realized I, I had no desire to be in a hotel room in Australia with two screaming children for three months. That you, the sabbatical is what you need to recover from that. So I, I called up United Airlines and said, I, I don't want to go to Australia. And they said, for a thousand bucks, you don't have to go to Australia. We'll refund you those tickets. And um, I, instead of feeling uh, disappointment, I was filled with a kind of strange euphoria. And then I read a year later that one of the great joys in life is planning a grand vacation and then bailing out at the last minute and not actually having to go on it. You get all the anticipation and then you don't have to get the body cavity search at the airport or spend all that money or have an accumulation of months of emails to deal with. So all of a sudden I had all this free time in my life, but I, I wanted to do something. So I decided talked to my wife, we'd take a car trip up to Portland, Oregon. I live in the Bay Area, and we uh, also looked at the map and realized we couldn't make it all the way to Portland, Oregon. Medford was the place to stop, and I was back on the phone making travel plans. I called the Homewood Suites, and I'm going through the discounts, and I realized that the AARP discount, which I now qualify for, is going to save me the most money. I'm so proud of myself. I come rushing out to my wife to tell her about the 15 bucks I saved us through this new discount, and she remembered the $1,000 I had cost us not going to Australia. <laughs> She was unimpressed, and she also, uh, you, you asked for the cribs, right? I, so I had to call back, and there's an 18-year-old guy working the night desk, and I said, that's Mr. Friedman, Mr. Senior Citizen Discount. I said, yeah, that's me. Can I have two cribs? 
and I felt in that moment, my AARP discount in two cribs, I realized I was rapidly becoming a neither nor, uh, neither young nor old. Um, I remember when I was in the sixth grade and Mrs. Graham, my teacher, told us about onomatopoeias and oxymorons, Stephen Douglas, the little giant. Well, I was becoming the young old, the working retired, the walking dead. And, and I feel like in that moment, I also, um, became part of a large group of people who are moving into this uncertain identity as we cross beyond midlife but are still a long ways off from anything in a traditional sense of being elderly senior citizens. Um, and yet when we think about this phenomenon as a society, contradiction in terms is also evident, right? We, you, we go to the doctor and they tell us to reduce our stress, to walk around the block, to eat more cruciferous vegetables, you know, to do all these things so that we can live long lives. And, and it really, as a society, it's been a remarkable transformation. Average life expectancy in this country was 47 at the turn of the last century. Today, it's approaching 80. Even more remarkably, half the children born in the developed world since 2000 will see their 100th birthday. So this has been a, a triumph. It's been an unevenly distributed one. Um, uh, William Gibson, the science fiction writer, says the future's already here, it's just unevenly distributed. That's certainly the case in the longevity revolution in terms of class and education, economic status, but it's still a remarkable shift over the longer term. And yet for all of the uh, positive aspects of that, when you pick up the editorial pages or the policy magazines, you listen to the pundits on TV, it seems like the worst thing that ever happened to us, right? This long gray wave of greedy geezers will soon be taking America to the cleaners, bankrupting posterity, where it's almost as if the Weather Channel has sponsored the entire demographic transfer, the age quake, right? The gray tsunami. Um, and, and yet, um, it's supposed to be the best thing that happened to us as individuals turns out to be this demographically determined uh, sea of despair and dependency, dependency ratios, working age population is defined as 15 to 59. Um, so how can, how can this paradox, this longevity paradox apply and also be determined already in advance? Um, demography is destiny, we're told. You know, there's one way out which uh, Christopher Buckley, the wonderful satirist, wrote about in his book Boomsday a few years ago, euthanasia for boomers at 70, right? It's a story of a, of a young woman whose profligate boomer father squanders her college savings and she goes to Capitol Hill as an aide and gets her revenge. She comes up with this, this uh, plan that families get iPods and all kinds of, uh, of benefits and society gets out of its longevity paradox. In the big shift, I propose an alternative solution in case that earlier one doesn't turn out to be politically viable, which is that the nature of life is shifting, is under as radical a revision um, as the numbers that we all know so well and, and hear about all the time, a doubling of the population over 60, more people over 65 than under five, as Alana was mentioning. And I, I feel like we need to start by dispensing with the current um, uh, difficulties in, in embracing this period, right? You hear 60s, the new 30, it's the new 50, 40. There was actually an AARP survey a couple years ago to finally nail down, is it the new 30, 40, or 50? And yet I go into my pharmacy in Northern California last month where I'm greeted by a sign that says, senior citizen 60 and older, make sure to claim your discounts, right? The AARP discount again. So apparently 60 is the new 90 as well as the new 30. Um, I, I suggest we just split the difference and accept that 60 is the new 60. That this period in life is new territory, the people flooding into it are a new phenomenon on the demographic landscape, which can sound um, hubristic, but in fact, stages of life are, are social inventions and they always have been that way. I, I started, um, learning that in an earlier book when I looked at the history of retirement in America. In the late 1940s, retirement was a desperate state. Walter Ruther, the UAW leader, got up in front of his union's convention in 1948 and described retirees as too old to work, too young to die. This state of, of limbo, despair, dangling at the end of the lifespan, essentially an ante room to the great beyond. And yet within 15 years, we had transformed 
this period that it's somebody else described as a roleless role, Lewis Mumford, social critic in the mid 50s said at no point in any society had any group been so rejected as older people today. We turned that period into a destination, a cornerstone of the American dream. We invented something called the golden years. Soon the goal wasn't just retiring, it was getting there as early as possible. My own father retired at 57 um, to spend as, as long as as we could in this period of payoff for all the years of hard work. And now it's 2011 and we're being told that that doesn't work anymore, and it doesn't. The idea of a 30-year retirement, there was an Allstate ad last year that said the generation that never planned, never trusted anyone over 30, never planned on 30 years of retirement, and concludes saying, you know, the way to save retirement is to save for retirement. But how many of us can save for 30 years of retirement? And how many people in the future are going to be able to do that? And how, as a society, can we afford to write off the most experienced 20, 25 percent of the population. To go back to Alana's work on sustainability, this is a kind of human sustainability. The current arrangement with 10,000 people a day turning 60 is unsustainable. We're going to have to come up with something different. Um, we made virtue out of a necessity when we invented the last phase of retirement. We need to once again find a way to turn necessity into virtue. And it turns out that we've always done that with life stages. It wasn't just retirement. Childhood barely existed in this country before the 19th century. We'd dress children as little adults and we'd expect them to act accordingly. A hundred years ago, in 1904, a book was published, by, uh, the, the title Adolescence by G. Stanley Hall, who turns out to be one of the greatest forces in American psychology, the first PhD in psychology in the country, the person who started the American Psychological Association. He was 60 at the time, and he wrote a book talking about this proliferation of young people who weren't quite in childhood anymore, who weren't yet adults. He called them adolescents. Forty years later, Seventeen magazine was born and coined the term teenage. We now hear about tweens, so this is a process that unfolds over many years, and we saw this group as a problem. We saw them having the physical maturity of adults, but the emotional maturity of children. And at a time of rapid change, industrialization, urbanization, immigration, there was a lot of concern that they were basically going to tear the place apart. So we created child labor laws and high schools and boys and girls clubs. And, and in, in, in Missouri, children, adolescents were being sentenced to high school in the 1910s and 20s. It was, a, it was a way to try to deal with what we saw as a growing social problem. And so th there's a history of inventing these stages. In fact, G. Stanley Hall, 20 years after he invented adolescence, wrote a book saying, I made a big mistake. We should have invented a new stage of life between midlife and old age. That was the penultimate stage. Um, and he uh, called it senescence, uh, which uh, may explain why it's never caught on. But <laughs> If you go back and, and read that book, it's actually a be beautiful description of this period. He describes these years as an Indian summer. And he says that human beings don't reach their full capacities until the shadows start slanting eastward. I gave a talk in Minneapolis last week, and they didn't want to hear anything about shadows slanting eastward after having five months of snow. But um, it, the, the idea of, of a, a stage at this period has actually been around for, for quite some time. And I think now we've got to take it seriously, uh, in part because of the numbers. You know, 78 million boomers flooding into this period, as I was saying earlier, um, close to 10,000 a day, hitting that big 6-0. Also because this is a period of awkward identity for people. Who wants to be a neither nor, and who wants to be a neither nor for a period that could be as long as midlife in duration? And it's an awkward time, not just in terms of what do you call yourself, um, uh, but also how you get from what's last to what's next. The, there aren't good pathways, there aren't the rites of passage, you know, we had the retirement party and, and the gold watch, the routes of passage, e, 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 the, the way to finance this period, and the group, just like those adolescents a hundred years ago, that's entering this period is seen as, as one that's a social problem, that's going to bring down society, that's going to look out entirely for their own interests, use their political power uh, to, to squander the future in, in many ways. President Clinton uh, talked himself last year in an interview about how we'd lost this vision of being a tomorrow society, a future-oriented society. So I think this combination of numbers, um, of the difficulty 
getting our arms around this period with so many people uh, at loose ends and also this view that it could actually be a problem that, that the current arrangement is unsustainable is going to lead us once again to, to rethink this period and in doing so rethink the whole map of life, right? We invented the current map of life for three score and ten. That was what the, the idea is. You'd live to about 70 if you're lucky. You, you'd retire at 65 and have a few years to take a well-deserved rest. But there were ironies from the very beginning. You know, 65 was based on the Prussian military pension that was set in the 1870s. Otto von Bismarck himself was convinced that the state would never pay a single pension. He was, I think, 78 at the time himself. <laughs> The first social security check was given out in January 1940 after five years of you know, extensive planning to a woman named Ida Mae Fuller in Vermont, a retired bookkeeper who just stumbled into her local post office and she got the number. So she ended up living to 100, right? She paid $20.75 into the system, got $22,888.92, qualifying her as probably America's first lottery winner in the process. <laughs> and I'm a big fan of social security, so I don't, I don't use that to kind of make a, a different point, but I think the handwriting was already on the wall. The ideas were already being started 100 years ago, but now it's time to, to take them face on. And, it's difficult. It's easy to look back historically and say, hey, this is how we created adolescence. This is how we created childhood. It's another matter entirely to think prospectively, how do you create a new stage of life, especially in the context of so many vested interests in the way we used to do things. But I think if you, if you look at these other examples, there are two main lessons that, that come out. The first is we've got to think differently about this period. Really try to understand what the essence of this phase of life is. And Skip Rutherford talked about sunrises and sunsets. And I, I, think, I, I think there's a lot to that particular distinction because you, you reach this period in life and you've got time lived, right? You've got experience. Um, but there's also the question of time left to live. You realize that there are fewer years ahead than there are behind. Uh, that changes your perspective. There's research coming out of Stanford University by the, a psychologist there, Laura Karstensen, which shows that as that people have an exquisite sense of time left to live in life, and as they, that time draws uh, shorter, becomes more compressed, it changes people's priorities. This started out when she was doing research on isolated older people, and she discovered that actually they weren't isolated. They were getting rid of all the people in their life they didn't have any time for anymore. You know, if I only got... 18 months to live, you know, I'm not going to spend it with cousin Billy who's been driving me crazy since 1962 about how I need to do this and that. Um, so I, I think there is this, this reality that, that the road does not go on forever and that the decisions you make um, are different than the ones you made when you thought the road was going to go on forever when you were 25 and starting out. And yet at the same time increasingly, and you see it with models like President Carter and President Clinton, you realize that that road could go on for quite a bit longer. You might have another good 20, 25 years. There was a, a bad TV show that lasted, I think, couple of episodes with John Lithgow a few years ago called 20 Good Years. And I think a lot of people realize that while, you know, there's an existential reality, you know, you, you read your college reunion notes or you go to the doctors and you get a test that's not exactly what you hoped or some parents pass away. Um, there's this finite dimension, but there's also this expansion along with the contraction, this real, realization that you may well have enough time to do something significant. Then you remember how fast the last 20 or 25 years went by and you realize it's time to get going. And so I think the essence of this period in many ways could be encapsulated. Remember that French Revolution slogan, equality, fraternity, liberty, mortality, longevity, urgency. And I, uh, I think that doesn't necessarily give us the name for it. There are a lot of different names that have been suggested since in essence, but I decided to go right to a, a, a critical source. I had a conversation with my mother-in-law over a laundry hamper about six months ago, and I said, Donna, what should we call this period of life? And first she said, oh, it is a distinct period. She called it the age of fulfillment. Um, so I said, well, do you have a name? Oh, yeah, I talk to my sister Pat about this all the time. It, I'm on my next to last dog. She figures she's got about six years on the current pooch, which is a, a mix between a dachshund and a fox terrier. 
And then she figures she could get a midsize, you know, have about another 14 years in it. It's not like she's going to be measured for a casket at that point, but she, you know, you got to clean up after it and walk it and all that kind of stuff. So um, I, I went and did a, a longevity test on it. There's a guy at Boston University, Thomas Pearls, who's the foremost expert on longevity. You go to his website, he'll tell you exactly how much time you have left to live. According to, to uh, the answers I put in, she, she's going to live to 97. So then she immediately repeated it and got 96 and informed me that she knew some things about her life that I didn't. So I, I didn't then I ask any more questions. And then this big crisis happened because the dog died last week, right? <laughs> so maybe it's two dogs left. Um, but whatever the name is, I ended up calling it the encore years in this, in this book because there was an article uh, in the New York Times Magazine, I think in September of last year, about a growing group of psychologists who think the 20s um, are becoming a distinct stage of life, emerging adulthood. You know, all those people who are moving back in with you, they're not necessarily failed adults. They're in emerging adulthood. So I think we're getting back to Shakespeare's notion of seven stages of life, childhood, adolescence, emerging adulthood, midlife, uh, encore adulthood, retirement, and old age, which is is fitted for five score lifespan, um, and I think we're midway from the old 70 uh, to to uh, to one that approximates three digits. But I, I think we're going to have to be creative in the new uh, uh, institutional arrangements we we come up with. It's not just going to be a matter of positive thinking or thinking differently. And if you look at at retirement in this country and the kind of inventiveness we've had over the last half century. We invented not only names like senior citizen for this period, but we invented retirement communities, senior centers, social security, Medicare, elder hostel, AARP. You could go on and on, but it was a spectacular period of transforming what was a desert into a destination. And I think we're going to have to rise to the occasion once again. And I think that the critical uh, um, and most needed set of innovations are really around pathways of getting from what's last to, to what's next. Um, a lot of the people I wrote about in the book were having to make things up on their own. Uh, I've, I've interviewed a woman whose daughter went into Teach for America, decided she too wanted to become a public school teacher, so she snuck into Teach for America, and she ended up in a Houston dorm room in July. The weather was 120 degrees. She was sharing a bathroom down the hall with three 22-year-olds. She did it. Um, another guy who wanted to become a park ranger after a career in fundraising went into the Student Conservation Association internship program where everybody else was 19, but he did it. And he's now a park ranger at the northeast corner of Yellowstone. He's got a hat. He's got a badge. Um, <laughs> Another woman became, went from being a real estate agent to a river restoration expert. She had to move into a 250 square foot garage. So she's, she's hoping to get to the 950 square feet to, to in her words, live like a nun. Um, and so, you know, there are always going to be people who are just loaded, you know, who can afford to buy themselves out of this situation um, or absolutely determined in the way that these three individuals are. But I think we need to create a front door in place of these side doors. That's why I think the Encore Fellowship Program that Daryl's trying to initiate here in Little Rock is so important. It's essentially a gap year for grown-ups. It's a chance for people to take a step back, to get exposed to new opportunities, um, to get a foot in the door. I think we need a new kind of education. We've got education for young people, education for old people. I think we need education for middle people. Why do we spend all of our money on education, all those student loans from 18 to 25? It's hard to know at 18 what you're going to want to do at 58. Um, so I think we're going to redistribute um, those costs and that time over the life course. I think we need a new way to save for this period. There was an article in Time magazine last month about the doubling of people over 50 going to theology school. Uh, it was called Holy Enrollers. Um, definitely the headline <laughs> of the month as far as I'm concerned. But it tells the story of a woman who went from being a pediatric nurse to being an Episcopal priest. She had to sell her house, her car. It cost her $100,000. So that's a, that's a lot of a cost at that stage of life. Something we've got to save for, I, I think along with individual retirement accounts, we should have IPAs, individual purpose accounts, for these transitions and take some of that money, that's the big balloon payment at the end of life of leisure and distribute it to these other natural transition points. 
let's change Social Security um, uh, in a way that has greater flexibility. Why not being able, be able to take a year or two of Social Security in your 50s when you go from being a pediatric nurse to an Episcopal priest and agree to work an actuarially adjusted period longer before getting your full benefits? I don't know if that will work or any of these other solutions will work, but I think we need to be having as rich a debate about how people move into this next chapter, what the policy options are. I think one of the most important opportunities is, is for social mobility at this point. My favorite program of all, uh, government program, is something called Troops to Teachers, which was created by an 86-year-old retired history professor after the first Gulf War who saw all these sergeants coming back and having a hard time finding their footing, and he knew that we had a shortage of, of urban high school teachers at that point. He said, you know, well, there are always people who've been in the middle of the desert with a bunch of unformed 18-year-olds. Maybe they do okay in the middle of a classroom with some unformed 17-year-olds. Turns out it's three times the retention rate of traditional ed school graduates, and it's an opportunity for a lot of people who went into the service because they couldn't go to college the first time around to get a, a second chance. If we pull this off, I think we can turn this inevitable um, uh, demographic transition, this supposed longevity paradox, in, into the payoff that it should be good for individuals, good for the country, especially because we're going to keep trying to live longer and to m extend the benefits of longer life. So we may as well make the most of it. I think we could produce something that's sustainable in, pre in place of the unsustainable current arrangement. I mean, we're good at at preserving paper and plastics, what about human beings? We seem all too eager to throw them out long before their past due date. Um, I think we could unleash uh, uh, an enormous uh, uh, windfall of creativity, of experience, of public service in the society. You know, mortality, longevity, urgency, demography enabled by by individual action, by new institutions, by public policies, could, could really um, be something quite remarkable, something that changes our culture. And I'll go back to President Clinton's comment about how we need to think more about future generations uh, to become a tomorrow society, a future-oriented society. There are a lot of boomers who went around and gave commencement address addresses last year and the year before across the political spectrum who basically said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry because we're going to be the first generation in American history to leave things worse off than we found it. And I think that this group can turn that around. Eric Erickson, who was the great psychologist of adulthood, said that the hallmark of successful development in this phase of life was the idea of generativity. He said, I am what survives of me. And when you think about it, um, what do we do with with our generative heartland, the group that's most exquisitely feeling that notion of generativity, because it's not just time lived and experience, time left to live, that new kind of motivation, but there's a realization, you know, when along with the road not going on forever, that we're a species that lives from generation to generation. That's always been the American dream as well, the immigrant dream to make things better off for future generations. I think now's the time to turn that around, and I think if we do, we could produce a generativity revolution along with an abundancy ratio and really navigate these dramatic demographic shifts in a way that was not just good for us boomers who are moving through now, but like I was saying earlier, good for future generations who are going to live these longer lives. And I think in the process, do something really quite remarkable, which is to change the shape of lives. So young people in the future, again, they will be making decisions at 18 knowing that they're going to have a second bite at the apple, that there are more opportunities. Uh, you don't have to get everything done all at once. So uh, in the end, um, I'd say if, if I had to condense this whole, talk about a run-on sentence that needs punctuation <laughs> into a single bumper sticker, I'd say it's time to replace that old sticker that we saw a decade or two ago. I'm spending my children's inheritance. Remember that? It wasn't funny then definitely not funny now, with a new one that doesn't even say I'm leaving my legacy, I'm living my legacy. Never before have we had so many people with so much experience and the time to actually do that legacy work um, and to leave the world better off than we found it. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. We do have time for some questions. If you raise your hand, we'll get a, get a microphone to you. No? Okay. So, um, what do you think we on-corners 
are going to do with broadband in our homes? Um, that's what, what are those of us in the uh, Encore years going to do with broadband in our homes? And, um, you know, we've been, um, in, in some of the other stops on the book tour, we've been auctioning off an hour of uh, career counseling, Encore career counseling, with one of my colleagues who's the former uh, career change columnist for the New York Times. Um, and I've been joking that the, uh, that's what the winner gets, the loser gets an an hour of encore career counseling with me, where I talk to them about the history of childhood, you know, in the Western world, and I feel a little bit like that with the, this question because I'm somebody who can, you know, barely master dial-up. But I'll, I'll tell you the story of a guy named Tim Will, um, who was one of the Purpose Prize winners. Uh, as we talked about before, Purpose Prize is this blasphemous prize for people over 60 who are innovators, entrepreneurs in their most creative period. Uh, we get about 1,500 nominations a year for the 10 prizes, which gives you an idea of how much this ferment, uh, how strong it is. And one of the winners two years ago was from North Carolina, a guy named Tim Will, been in the Peace Corps early in his life, worked in the telecommunication industry had, had wired much of Latin America for broadband in, in some of his earlier roles. He first tried to become a high school teacher in his encore period in Florida, D didn't work out, moved to uh, Rutherford Town, North Carolina, and found his footing. And it was all around helping local farmers um, get wired for broadband, doing uh, education around sustainable farming, and then using this internet capacity to connect restaurants in Raleigh that wanted to serve uh, locally grown, sustainable produce, organic produce with these farmers. And uh, it's been, a, 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 it's called Foothills Connect, his, his project. In fact, he, when he won his purpose prize, HP also gave him $100,000 in technology so he could expand the program. Uh, just one example of how people are not only using broadband, but, but uh, helping to extend technology to, uh, to create economic development. Okay. That's a really ex exciting talk. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, your, the concern of the uh, people that are maybe in their 20-somethings, 30-somethings about finding employment and those of us that are in our 50s and 60s who say, no, you know, we're, especially given the change in even the demographics of the 50s when maybe our mums were at home, uh -huh. now there are people like myself in our 50s and 60s, we're women, we're going to be here till we think at least till we're 70 at our job, but then we've got young women who are in their 20s and 30s saying, you know, I'm getting an excellent degree, but I'm not getting a good job. Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I don't know if everybody heard that question, but it, it, was, it focused on the concern of many young people that their opportunities to get into the job market, into careers, are being foreclosed by all these people in their 50s, 60s, 70s who were hanging on to their jobs. And, you know, it's, when, when we first started pushing Encore careers at Civic Ventures, which we thought of as a kind of practical idealism. You know, it's some, a, a new career phase at the intersection of continued income, new meaning, social impact. It seemed like, you know, who could be against this? There were all these projected job shortages in education, health care, you know, everybody's wringing their hands about what we're going to do. And it's a different environment now. And it's a real challenge, and I won't pretend to have the, the answer to this, I, I have a few thoughts. Um, um, one is that I, I feel like this, we're talking about a long-term change here, and it's really comparable in many ways to the movement of so many women, as I was saying earlier, into new roles in the 60s and 70s. It felt like a zero-sum environment at that point, and now we look back and we know we couldn't be competitive globally without that segment of the population um, so engaged. And I think, you know, a quarter century from now, we'll think the same way about people in this group. And I think the big question is, how does a society make fullest use of its talent and idealism? And it's going to change the whole pattern of lives. Uh, and, and at the same time, we really need to be developing this period, as I was saying earlier, in many ways for those young people who are going to have to work 
longer. But over the short term, there, there's a lot of conflict, um, um, and um, there are some um, aspects of this where, where trade-offs are happening and it's not necessarily good for young people. So I think it's, I think it's a real challenge um, to figure out how to, to make, to go through a change like this in a, a depressed job environment, but I think over the long term, um, it will change the whole pattern of, of lives and it will be good for young people who will work longer. I mean, you know, some of the questions that this raises, uh, people have suggested we should have social security for young families, right? Because that's when people are most crunched and then will work later. So I think it's raising big questions about what the trajectory of a life is, of a career. Um, but it's not like you just flip a switch and everything, you know, the birds start singing in the clouds part. And in many ways, it's an awkward time. So I, I would say that this is ultimately going to be good for people of all ages um, and that people of all ages need to be involved in what's essentially a design project um, of, of a new view of careers and the life course. But uh, you know, I've heard from a lot of young people who feel like their opportunities are being foreclosed because there are all these boomers who are at a point where the two choices they face are hanging on to what they're currently doing or the abyss. And I think if we created better transition pathways for people to move into phases of work where maybe they have less responsibility but greater meaning, um, it'll unclog things. And but that this is going to be iterative. So I wish I had the you know perfect win-win answer, but I think this is one of the struggles that we have to figure out. Yes, ma'am. We are a mobile society and every decade following a census we realize there have been demographic and geographic shifts that have occurred. Do you foresee continued or newfound geographic shifts that may occur as a result of our continued maturation and are there regions of the country, states in the country that may stand to benefit and conversely, others that may not fare as well. <laughs> you know, your your question about uh, upcoming regional uh, geographic uh, shifts that are possible. It reminds me of a cover of Where to Retire magazine that I saw at some airport last year or the year before, and the the key. You know, it was a picture of uh, somebody in a kind of traditional retirement posture, you know, atop uh, a mountain, you know, the peak of vigor, a uh, husband and wife with their golden retriever. And the headline underneath is, it was the, the 10 best places to work in retirement, right? You know, again, the sort of oxymoronic idea, you know, retirement's supposed to mean, you know, if you go to the dictionary, to go off into seclusion, it's the opposite of work. and. And I think that we'll start to see a, a different kind of competition for people at this stage of life, um, one that's less based on the, you know, the best place to have a golden year's existence and some, something that's much closer to the best place to have a role in life, a reason to get up in the morning, uh, a sense of purpose. And I think there could be an economic development competition, not just among regions within the United States, but among countries. There's some people who argue, you know, since Western Europe Asia, you know, 40 to 50 percent of Korea, Japan, Germany, Italy, Spain are going to be over the age of 60 by mid-century. Um, and, you know, one way to look at that is, you know, dependency ratios. Another is how well countries use the segment of the population is going to determine how well they do um, uh, in, in a globally competitive environment. And I think we'll see a different kind of competition over people and people moving to places where they can have a real role. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, it oh, made you. me wonder about um, a topic that uh, I uh, wondered if you had thought much about, um, and that is what sort of medical system might uh, address our aging population and yet still be fair um, to younger people? I want to hear your thoughts on that. You know, I, I, um, uh, I'm not an expert on, on health care, but I, I really do think um, as people start to get a picture of, of longer lives with, with more stages and, and newer chapters, that it's going to improve 
um, their incentives to take care of themselves, you, you know, that, and because they realize that they're going to need to be able to be mentally, physically healthy um, to to sustain um, um, econ economic and and financial uh, sustainability. So I, I I do think that our whole outlook towards preventive care is going to be augmented by uh, by a new picture of of lives, and so I um, um, uh, you know I think it's going to it's going to change what we do as young people as well as as what we do in a more kind of emergency way later on. Um, I um, I do think that there the growing proportion of people in this stage of life is going to drive a lot of investment in healthcare. Um, you know, a lot of people think that one of the silver linings in a grayer population is not only jobs, there are going to be a lot more jobs taking care of older people um, in, in various ways. That's a, a growth industry, but also a lot more investment in um, uh, medical technology that helps people uh, live healthy through these longer years. So, you know, I think that that'll be a big change. Um, I, this is almost a non sequitur, but I, I know we're getting close to to the end of the time, and I um, I wanted to focus on this issue of creativity on the part of people at this juncture, because we have a notion of uh, of innovation, uh, entrepreneurship, creativity that's the exclusive province of of young people, and I think. That that's certainly one of the most important drivers of innovation in society, youth. But there's now research from economists who um, who look at the value of creativity at different points in life. And um, a guy by the name of David Gallinson at University of Chicago who shows that conceptual geniuses tend to bloom early. They do their best work in their late teens, early 20s. Um, but there's a second group of creatives who uh, are experimenters, and by its very nature, that kind of creativity blooms later in life. And I, so, I think as a society, um, you know, we'll see innovation in healthcare and so forth, but we'll also see a lot of innovation coming from the kind of people who apply for the Purpose Prize or who are doing that innovative work in private business. And that, that could really be a surprise benefit of these longer lives. Um, I'll give you an example of uh, a one Purpose Prize winner uh, in this vein, uh, a guy named Robert Chambers, who was from Alabama, who worked in the banking industry, who retired to New Hampshire, realized they didn't have enough money to, uh, to keep afloat financially, so he started working at a used car dealership in New Hampshire, and he uh, ended up um, discovering that the profits of this dealership were coming mostly from taking advantage of rural buyers who were unsophisticated generally. They called them woodchucks. They'd have training seminars on how you take advantage of woodchucks. And he saw this happening time and again. And one day a guy's driving off with a car that has about six months left in it, having taken advantage of giving a five-year loan at a usurious rate, driving with smoke belching out of the back of this car. And he realizes that this is a moral um, um, tragedy, that this guy is going to be unable to get to work and going to have four and a half years of car loans when this car dies. He's, he's, his whole family is going to go down. And he was so angry about it, he, you know, he started, his juices started flowing. He couldn't afford to just walk out the, the door. But he ended up, he was a big fan of car talk on NPR, click and clack. He started Bonnie Clack to stand for car loans and counseling. Um, and he started a nonprofit that provides fuel efficient new cars, credit counseling, and low interest loans to low income rural buyers. Uh, it's expanded to throughout northern New England. And when Robert Chambers got um, uh, invited to the White House a year or two ago to, uh, to talk about what he was doing along with a bunch of younger social innovators, he said, I was old enough to know injustice when I saw it and experienced enough to do something about it. And I thought, wow, that's just perfect. And I said, I said oh, Robert, it's been so great going in the White House. He said, oh, yeah, but that, that's nothing. I got interviewed by Click and Clack that year, too. So, um, well, I think that's a perfect place to end on. Thank you, Mark, so much for coming. And Daryl, thank you for uh, helping us bring him here. We do have copies of uh, The Big Shift over here and hope to see you soon. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs>